Hello, thank you for tuning in. Um, a, here's another, you could say, a philosophical um, orientated discussion um, with a bunch of people that you're familiar with and a new person, Mr. Rose, um, who I just met in this video and I enjoyed him deeply, so welcome. I want to officially welcome him to the conversation. Um, so this one, I, I'm calling it Anxiety's Reversal. And it's, because it's interesting, because I found this conversation to, to be revealing of the strange way in which um, when one deeply uh, opens to their being and realizes that their being is... Um, is constantly a one huge paradox, right, in so many different levels, that it becomes very practical to, to, to turn towards it, right? And that's opposite of what we often want to do, right? It's also the case that when we open to our being, we'll find a being that doesn't want to do that, right? And yet the challenge is, is, to, is to turn towards it. And there's some real practical consequences to that that are really really good and so this this video goes pretty deep into it it was a lot of fun to have so thank you for joining me um, on this as always and uh, so so some housekeeping so a few things like one is we have a if you're interested in circling um, through the circling Institute which is my company we, uh, we, we have a circling weekend intensive coming up, and it's called Sovereign, which is the first stage of circling. It's, it's what circling ultimately deepens practices, and its sovereignty is that which essentially is about your freedom as an individual in a profound relationship in the world. So like when you're deeply sovereign, consider the places where you're deeply sovereign are precisely those places where when you, the place from which you act from, your sovereignty, right, is already in a, rela a profound relationship in, in, in the world such that your actions reveals the depth of the world that simultaneously affords the depth of you to come out as your actions and your being. And that mutual reciprocal opening, right, as John Verveke would say, the agent and arena relation um, comes to fruition. And essentially, in a very, very deep way, all relationship and all intimacy requires this or presupposes it and deepens it. And circling is the practice of this deep way of being. All right, links for all that are, are below. I also do one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have um, the, the Circling Facilitator course is open for registration. And we have drop-in events every Thursday, 6 to 9 p.m. California time. Thank you so much. Um, have enough of a... Oh, there's a recording. I, you know, I heard the voice. I, so is this where we do introductory things, Javier? No, 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 guys? wait, wait. I will, I will also start Let's with... Um... <laughs> yeah, I don't know who Javier is other than... He, 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 <laughs> that yeah. handsome guy so on like the third he, block. You see that guy? That one. Kids, yeah. Kids are like soap somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, there's that tension of a confused metaphor that's going to unlock deeper understanding. So kids are soap. Let's start from there. There's a tension and we'll go from there. No, D D Daniel, did you want to open my good man? And there's no, no, you, you already started. Let's do this. Just we, we start in joyful confusion. Okay, so go ahead. Yeah, I, need, I need to find out who people are, though. I'm, I actually don't know what the meeting's really about. Um, Oh, we don't either. I'm glad. She, I'm glad somebody said it, guy. Right. I just turned. I just turned on my computer, and the Zoom popped up. You oh, know, okay, I'm glad cool. somebody so missed meeting you. <laughs> you know, I'm glad somebody said it. Oh yeah. gosh, I wasn't sure. So, rumor has it we're supposed to talk about the weather, the <laughs> World Series. You know, the best soccer players. Some something like, and uh, our favorite color. I think is what we were supposed to talk about. Did I get those notes? Let me check my notes. Oh crap! It's on paradox, contradiction, intention, and leisure. Oh shoot! I got all the wrong notes. Let me go through. Okay, so something deep and philosophical, I think, guy. That's the rumor. Okay, cool. <laughs>
I will, I will, I will perhaps start this this thing with uh, just just a thought. Um, you know, in, in religion, nothingness. We have this where um, when I first taught, heard about Scolé in Johannes's course, um, I mean, I heard about, about that concept before, but we really dig deep into it in Johannes's course from last year, and. I immediately had this connection that this is like this is like the shunyata in, in Buddhism. Because, because in, in Skole, we can have a real relationship with time, but also with other things, finitude, death, um, and so forth. And then when 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 Nishitani, for example, was talking just about how how the existential mode of man um, um, shows itself within the field of shunyata. For example, as a ch it's it's like it's when a child is playing, right? Um, then, and and the, the, the deepest earnestness is also a form of play on the field of shunyata. And that was very similar to what we were um, also articulating with Scolé. Because right, Scolé is that it's it's really about time. It's also about space, but it's it's also really about time. And having a real relationship to time. And then what to tie this in also with dialectics, Nishitani also proposed that um, the deepest, this deep strife right between the opposites that Heraclitus articulated, that that war between the, the dialectical opposites can only become peace at this field of Shunyata. Mm -hmm. Because there they can be hold in their and realized in their in their suchness, in their respective suchness. Um, so we, we are always holding, um, having a right, we holding the the, the 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 opposite, so to say. So that that's a way, of, right? And and this question of reconciling the opposites was also very important for um, Heidegger, right? Yeah. With the clearing, to 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 reconcile the opposites in a non-dialectical way. So you can go from there, what, <laughs> whatever grips you. All right, I won't talk about the weather then, if we're going to get into absolute nothingness <laughs> or the Major League Baseball game. Good. I'm glad you started on that. No, I mean, it's so interesting because you, um, you, know, you have the um, tendency of holding two things in tension, then the tendency to hold two things that you put together. Uh, but sometimes when you put them together, you negate the difference and don't make it a simplicity so you can get rid of the tension. Uh, and also, too, though, if you're led to believe that if there's any tension, there must be something wrong, then your natural disposition is going to be resolved that when, in fact, sometimes if you get rid of all tension, uh, well, then you can become complacent or you won't develop in ways you need to develop. And also, it's always interesting. You know, we want to be able to have periods of that absolute nothingness, that meditative absolute nothing, but we don't want nihilism, right? We want to learn how to be childlike, but we don't want to be childish, right? So there are these different things where like the goals are the things that are quite good. You want to have leisure, constructive leisure, but you don't want to be lazy. And yet it's very interesting because they're very similar. And so often in life, the, the main goals or the, the optimal states, uh, whatever the word optimal is, um, involves something that's very similar similar to a negative state or a version of it that's not good. And one of the problems can become if we do get in a habit of escaping tension, which if we were talking about the concept of leisure, sometimes you'll learn that the goal is to achieve a state of leisure where there's no tension at all. And then we don't even get to the discussion how you can have rest in tension because of matching up expectations of what you do with that free time. Well, then what could end up happening is that you develop habits um, to get rid of tension of which compel you to ways that are quite healthy. And then once you do that, the likelihood that you end up in childishness as opposed to childlikeness, um, uh, you know, nihilism as opposed to absolute nothingness becomes much higher. So I think, you know, you were talking about, you know, talking about leisure. Well, actually learning how to do leisure well is one of the ways that you stay in the positive version of these different things that are so similar that look the same, but actually because of the inner work can be, can be radically different. Uh, so, you know, it, it always isn't just like what nothingness, absolute nothing nihilism. What's the difference? Oh, the difference is a big deal and making sure. And then that gets into awareness, right? You're talking about awareness, like having this awareness of which of those you're falling into. And if you don't get into the practice of paying attention to awareness, which precisely in its paradoxical nature, then habituates you to tension, which is good in this way. Because here's the funny thing, too. If you actually don't habituate yourself to tension, you end up in anxiety. Like if you don't get a like a habit of attention in a constructive way, oh, you're still going to have it. It's just going to be the negative version of anxiety um, and, 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 and et cetera, so forth. Interesting. Oh, interesting. That's interesting. The thing about anxiety is un avoided paradoxical tension. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. In fact, it's interesting. I mixed my. No wonder I'm a. I like philosophy. I'm. I, I'm. I'm actually a dyslexic anxious. I'm an anxious person. <laughs> I'm dyslexic. <laughs> well, it's funny because, like, you know, there was a tradition of thinking of philosophy as linked with the pharmacist. Like that it had a medical sort of mental health sort of dimension, because one of the things is if you do philosophy, you get an expectation of having to think to live well. So then when you end up in situations where things don't go your way, well, you expected this. And so much of unhappiness, like if you listen to like very short or different people is when your expectations get usurped by reality. So there's something about philosophy that gets you habituated and expecting complexity. That doesn't mean you look for complexity. That doesn't mean you try to make complexity, but it means you have the ability to handle it. And so then you go into the tension and it's positive as opposed to being anxious producing, which then we can get into how today under pluralism, social, you know, sociology, givens are gone. So everyone's having to be a philosopher now, but since they don't have the habits of philosophy, it's turning into anxiety. And under that anxiety, political totalitarianism becomes appealing. But you know, that's a different subject. Let's go back to Schrodinger's nap. I, I think that's good. But no, it's like, you know, so I think philosophy is very helpful when you, in, to make sure that your anxiety um, is something that's a positive tension. Yeah. Uh, but of course, if you're not teaching philosophy or you tell people it's impractical or people are using their leisure poorly not to engage in thought, then they're not going to um, probably uh, have that positive development when they get to uh, when they when they face the uncertainties of life. Huh. And what I like about uh, anxiety and a lot of emotions in general is that we actually have a very self-correcting system, mm-hmm. believe it or not. It's very self-correcting. It, it just it, it's, it just amount to being aware of what's going on. Um, within mm-hmm. yourself because what I like about anxiety is that I have to ask myself okay what we have to assume possibly that this anxiety is wanting a direction now the question is to which direction does it want us to does, does it want us to go right because if anxiety is going the wrong direction um, where is the direction there's the correct direction to which I must proceed myself to um, this in itself is a tension, um, mm-hmm. but I enjoy it because it forces the individual to um, <laughs> actually go deep into oneself to acknowledge something that is not being acknowledged. And this is why the anxiety exists, because it's something that's not being acknowledged and it, it's crying for your attention. So mm-hmm. it, 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 the, the tension is there and you need to look at it. You need to look at it and listen to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think we can only do that in the mode of scholar. Mm-hmm. I can. Mm-hmm. I think I can tell you why. Um, right? What is was Heidegger put this so well with anxiety? Right? The nothing brings you before. So, so, so the nothing kind of like um, what churns up in anxiety, right? Yeah. And what is the nothing? We could say it's a possibility space that overwhelms you. Because philosophy is, infer- but when you read Nietzsche, so like all, all your presuppositions collapse and you're just, you're just standing before nihilism and you don't know what to do with yourself. <laughs> um, but, and then even with possibility, and that's something I got from De Gennaro when he talks about um, in weirdness of being, he talks, with, he quotes um, Emily Dickinson where she writes, dwelling in possibility which is, and then he translates that it, it could be likelihood because mm-hmm. the, the, the German rendering of, of possibility, möglichkeit, is more literally a likelihood. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. likely that, that like, that mögen, shares the same, shares a similar root word than the German word for, for leisure. Mm-hmm. Because, because what, what leisure is, is right, it's also it's like a possibility space in a sense. It's it that that's opened up. And you can only really um, take that space at that time, that time space, into care mm-hmm. if you are in that, that right relationship to it. Which scole, its root is connected with holding, right? Right. Right. This right. effective holding. I'm still and, with it. I'm still with just liking, realizing, uh, thinking of myself as a dyslexic, thing, <laughs> having a dyslexic anxiety disorder. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this explains everything. <laughs> hey, no, I'm also makes- thinking about care mm-hmm. in the sense of like, of 
of this whole sense of anticipate, like this 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 sense in which if I if I anticipate anxiety, or I or if I, if I if I anticipate paradox, right? If I anticipate incomprehensibility, I'm in a position ready to, in some sense, think, right? Which is, of course, puts me in a like just anticipating at all seems to already be caring, right? It already seems to be in that structure. It's just, it's interesting to think about this. Yeah. Did you know Heidegger opens his book, Mindfulness, it's translated mindfulness, Besinnung. That's right, that this is this event thinking these like five or seven works that he starts that with that quote from, from Periander, Meleta to Pan, which is just taking beings into care as a whole. That's that's a translation. So care is, is really important, I think. It's the way I think you care is is then also just it there's then a different attunement, right? Mm -hmm. To 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 your world in a mm -hmm. sense. What I wanted just to say, um, what Nishitani also says is um there's this there's a very primordial tension just in our existence between our, our past that always seems kind of like fixed and determined in a sense that already happened and then then the, the, the open possibility space of the future on the other hand and we are always on that, that gap in a sense between those two they also kind of like form a tension which is for the buddhist would be karma on the one side and some and um, being at doing so the, the necessity that we always do something tune ourselves to something hold ourselves perhaps but there's always this need to hold ourselves with the i would say and they are always kind of like they're always pressing on to us mm. and if we if we right if we cannot really if we cannot um oh it's all for nishitani it would be only on the field of shunyata where we can then really um um have shoulder our karmic responsibility and at the same time, be in a be in a mode of playful um, playfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well, first, you know, Kierke uh, Kierkegaard once said that the man in despair is the one who doesn't know he's he's in despair. So you knowing that your dyslexic tension is a wonderful step in the right direction, you know, Kierkegaard would be proud. Um, you know, second. One, one of the things is that philosophy is about, you know, I think Levinas said something where he said um, the point of philosophy is to make the ordinary strange again. Uh, the point of philosophy is, in fact, to um, wake you up from some kind of dogmatic slumber of everydayness uh, to start looking at yourself and to feel attention. And it's kind of interesting because it's almost like everyone has some sort of fall, you know, to use that uh, religious language it, where everyone does go through anxiety what Javier is saying, but the question is, do you use it as a constructive anxiety where then it turns into tension or do you forever stay in anxiety that then becomes deconstructive anxiety per se, if we're trying to overlay the language. So everyone's going to go through anxiety. The question simply becomes almost like in Christianity, you talk about everyone goes through sin, but the question becomes, you know, does that, is that anxiety used in a constructive manner um, in order to um, become a tension that you live? But one of the reasons though, I think people don't do that tension is uh, to use the language you're saying. Um, a lot of, uh, there's a, a writer, a Walker Percy, I think it's the last gentleman where he has this character that basically the whole idea of the book is that the modern person is someone who's so bent on keeping possibility open that he loses the capacity to realize any of it. Uh, he's so bent on having possibility, possibility that he never realizes any of it. But what, of course, happens if you never realize possibility? Nothingness. Uh, and then you get that negative anxiety. But this is not the positive nothingness. This is nihilism. Right. But you see, one of the reasons we don't like to choose is because today we know if we choose something, what's it going to be surrounded by? kind of nothingness, right? You know, we could, well, I could have done something else. And what if it's ultimately arbitrary and we start questioning ourselves? So it's tempting to just stay in the possibility space and exist in perpetual Freudian projection of what you could fill it, but you never ever realize a potential to hold. And you have to realize a potential to care, to have something that you're holding up from that void. And that's how you hold up from the nihilism into a state of the absolute nothingness to overlay that language. But of course, as you do it, you know it's surrounded by a kind of nothingness. It doesn't have the sociological givens of absolute because God is dead after Nietzsche and all that different stuff. I mean, some people don't agree with that, but you understand what I'm saying. And so then there could be the temptation to stop caring because you're like, well, it's ultimately nihilism anyway. And then the absolute nothing falls back into nihilism. So you and have to exist to in right. that tension. What's that guy? And then you get to be right. See? Yeah, that's the right. <laughs> 
Oh yeah. That's the thing. Well, that's, that's actually what's, there's, you know, one of the beauties, like once you say I'm, you know, self-destruction is confirmation. You know, once you go, oh, I'm never going to succeed and you engage in self-sabotage or stuff and stuff, you're like, see, I was right. Yeah. And there's something too, when you say life sucks and you drop it back into the void, see, life sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And so you're right. And so you have to like fight the brain. The thing I always like to say, the brain is the frenemy. The brain is the frenemy. It's what yeah. makes thought possible, but what also makes it so hard to think. Right. And likewise, the brain wants to be right. And so it's like, and caring is hard. Oh, and the other thing too, if you care, you're surrounded by people questioning that um, mechanism of care, that way yeah. that you care, that thing that you put your lot in. And so then you have social pressures against you. And then very often too, caring is a reflection of some degree of individuality and your aesthetic experience and who you are. And then that can really um, have some sort of um, social separation. Like, you know, if most people are using their free time to go to the movies and you're using your free time to read Heidegger, you gentlemen may not know this, but most people don't read Heidegger in their free time. Shock Talking. Calm down. I know. Uh, but if you're that crazy guy. In oh, Western no. Virginia, yeah, I'm sorry. I should. It was too soon. Too soon. I'm so sorry, Daniel. Too soon. Uh, but, you know, if in Westbrook, Virginia, you're doing that, you know, you know your, your free time, you're automatically kind of alienated, right? But you have to be willing to do that. If one, you're going to learn to make your anxiety constructive into tension that you live with. Yeah. Two, if you're going to realize a possibility okay. over the void that you then hold and care about. And then three, if you're existing in a dialectic tension, well, all of all the political systems, everything is about not being in tension. You're right. The conservatives are right. The liberals are right. Everything is about being right. And so that very act of existing in dialectical tension also has a certain um, separation element to it. Not because you're better than anyone. This isn't about elitism. This is just about the nature of it. Um, and, and there's a why I think it's, in it, you know, because I know we were ta talking about the potential of leisure. The question becomes, why? Why does it seem to be so hard to use leisure constructively listening to Bertrand Russell and, you know, the end of absence and different things? Because you have all of these different pressures, your own frenemy brain, the social environment, the uh, difficult, the um, you because also, too, when you realize the potential, you worry, am I missing out? You know, once I choose to live in this house and have kids and be on a farm, I'm not in New York, I could be doing different. You're always existing in those possibility spaces. So you feel like you might be doing something wrong. And then you have to engage in some sort of self-therapy or trust in yourself and believe in yourself. But what if you're deluded? You have to fight all of that. And again, to just go back to the point we were saying before, if you don't have any habits of that dialectical process or thinking that you can get from philosophy, if you haven't been to the philosophical gymnasium, to use that classical language, then the likelihood of you um, facing all of that and using it constructively yeah. at, at, to a constr from a to make it a constructive anxiety into a tension of which then drives you to higher you know better forms of life to, to allude to Javier it becomes very unlikely that one would do that. Huh. You know, there's something that I've been reading from Rilke. Rilke? Yeah, Rilke. Oh, um, there's the book called A Poet's Poet's Guide to Living. It's the wisdom of Rilke, and he's been really blowing my mind with the advice he's been giving because there's something that he said with that I could connect with this possibility of space. In one of his letters, he was saying to live your life to the fullest limit, right? But he was saying not to day to day, but it was actually in this kind of sifting of experiences where you try to find the intensity and depth, right? And he's, and he's not asking you to make sense of it. He's asking you to latch on to where the intensity lies, right? And I've been, <laughs> I, I've been, I'm like, okay, I understand what he's saying. At least that's what I feel like I understand what he's saying. But the more I kept questioning, what is this depth? What is intensity? What does that even mean um, when I'm trying to shift from experience to experience to experience and trying to find something that is intense and depth and I should dwell in there? Right. Because he's asking you, he's ultimately asking you to dwell in there, to dwell in the depth, the intensity. And, and just to connect to what um, OG Rose is saying here about how people want to diffuse tension. Right. I think to dwell in that tension is like probably can even be more fruitful um, in this moment. But, yes, I see Daniel want to say something. Just one uh, well, thing. I always want to, I always I always want to talk about how sorry I am that I don't have a banana smoothie. That's always what I want to say, Javier, because that's your favorite. I'm really sorry about that. But Guy was saying so. I didn't mean to interrupt. We, we, have, to, we have to. Daniel we have to. Like likes his two fingers doing this. We have to oh, make yeah. it. Right. We have to make an invention so we can send banana smoothies through soon. Yeah, I feel so bad about this. Every time we talk to Avera, we never have his favorite dessert. What kind of friends are we? I don't even know. <laughs> terrible. Uh, but but Daniel, what were you saying, sir? 
right? There's this, I just, um, John Avecchi <laughs> always talks about um, dialectic into dialogos. Mm. And, right, scolé or, or the possibility as likelihood, or perhaps, perhaps, right, with possibility, this kind of like space of real nothingness, and then we have likelihood as the space of no thingness. And we can transcend that dialectical tension into a kind of like dialogical caring that then affords that 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 moreness and that that we can actually dwell both in the tension and in the, which then becomes dialogical and in likelihood as such. <laughs> and I think what affords that is again it's it's. I mean, and that, that's, I think, what we come then with about Guy, because Guy also wanted to talk about um, circling in connection with Scolé or, or leisure. And, and I think that that's, I think, where's the, where's the key that we really dwell, even in that dialogical tension, which we have now, in a sense, right? Because we could also, I could also give in to my, right, social anxiety and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and or technological anxiety or, or whatever, right? But but we, we are we are it's always finding the right stance and right posture, countenance, so we can hold ourselves in that. And then there's this shift happening towards the dialogos. And then, then you, you suddenly see that this possibility space, which we thought is just nothingness, then it opens up as a kind of like as a, as a nothingness that is breathing and that's alive. And, and that's I think that's also for me scole. Although, right, time is nothing in a sense, but it's still, it's very much alive and it can become alive only through us as human beings. Mm -hmm. that, that's always one, what people like Heidegger that you now want to stress. What can only come alive through us? That, that scolé as, that time and, time and space as, as living, as actually breathing, as actually, that, that they are real dwelling grounds for man. Yeah. And that they're not just nothing, or, or like just, just collapsed into linear time or, or, or. I do have a question. <laughs> I do have a question, Daniel. What what does because I'm trying to grasp like what this dialogical caring um, looks like. Um, yeah, like yeah. What does what does dialogical caring look like? <laughs> what does it? Is he doing just super right simple, yeah. Sitting on me. the couch and eating barbecue chips. I knew this one. Uh, sitting on the couch and eating barbecue. That's not it. <laughs> okay, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> no, what I wanted to say is uh, what 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 um, Daniel pointed, so OG Rose pointed out was that, so confusing, um, right? I know two Daniels, OG Rose, <laughs> Michelle's name mixed with mine. I know it's great. Um, what well, it's easy to fall when we, Heidegger said, right? We um, dialectics are steering the world, mm -hmm. and what we have today is this kind of like re reactionary relationship to the other dialectical pole, mm -hmm. right? When you are left, then you you have to despise the right, and and there's a there's this this very um, sterile di dialectical tension going on all the time. Almost like an enframing in a sense, because then, then people also ask you, what are you, what side are you, um, whatever. Um, but in dialogos, for some reason, there, there's this shift happening where we transcend all of that. And where, so to say, the, the frenemy just becomes the friend. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, so this actually, this kind of reminds me of something I didn't quite understand what Rilke was saying about getting along with others. He was saying that once you have fortified your solitude, even this, despite the fact of your differences, what happens is you just appreciate the vastness between you, that space. He talks about this space, this vastness um, mm -hmm. that you just uh, love. Yeah. Can you say that again, guy? The world. It reaches from us and construes the world. He says, mm. you know a tree and its true element, um, surround it with restraint. It has no limits. Only in your renouncing is it truly there. I think it's kind of like starting to get to what you're talking about is a sense of like when you, eat, when you realize that there's nothing anything totally says for sure, right? In some sense. And then you, in some sense, grasp hold of something and go this, right? You're not... You're not denying that it's surrounded in nothing, right? But you're, in some sense, you're, you're, um, 
it, in some sense, it becomes productive, right? It, it, and then you have, and then, and then the nothing speaks up and goes, no, 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 no. And you have to, and that becomes this, this sense becomes this animation, if you will. This, it, it seems like, God, this is how one would, um, one's character would become ever more complex, right? start to think about wisdom you know you can imagine just somebody in that over and over and over and over again they just have they start to say these very kind of like well things are and they aren't and therefore i'm talking to you and then everyone was like wow <laughs> <laughs> well you know uh it's interesting because the word dialectic is always quite quite fascinating because you have dialectic where we could talk ontological dialectics, meaning that if I'm always trying to locate who I am, there's always something I'm leaving out. And in order to actually then get at an accurate understanding of who I am, I have to keep the tension of realizing that whatever I think in my completeness is actually incomplete because I can't remember every single experience. So there's a, there's a dialectic that is a tension. Then you have the word dialectic that's used kind of in a political sense, which almost means like in one of the papers in reconstructing it is, is the idea that there's opposing opposites, like a quote unquote dialectic between conservatives and liberals, right? Well, actually, it's not so much a dialectic because it, ha it can only be a dialectic if there's an appreciation of both sides that are using that dialectic in that tension constructively. What you have now is reactions against that kind of look dialectical because they're opposed. Mm -hmm. But in order to get a dialectic, you have to go against. And I think sometimes I'm going to go through Marx or something like, like dialectic is kind of used in that sort of reaction. It's a reaction against. But then I, you almost have more of that Hegelian dialectic, which, you know, that terrible phrase on um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Yeah. I know what it means, but there actually isn't a synthesis so much in Hegel. It's like an A slash B, as Fidel last talks about. We'll and that is... Sentence. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of like, and, and it's like living, it's expecting that A-B-ness instead of A-A-ness, that then because you expect it, the dialectic becomes in of, in its dialecticness, something you can rest in, actually, because your expectation matches it. Yeah. So, you know, it's very, I think it's one, like I've wanted to do a paper where I almost like have this or the, this side of thinkers by di dialectic mean this, this side yeah. of thinkers by dialectic mean that. Please write that for me. I, you know, if I'll I can feel, get, I've I'll asked Haven interested. to do it. I, Haven is supposed to have read the phenomenology of spirit. I don't know what that boy's doing. He wants to play Pokemon. I mean, what the yeah. heck? He's five. He should know better. He should, oh, he turned six. He should have his priorities straight. Um, you know, the other, the other thing is that when we talk about nothingness, what's so interesting, because it sounds kind of strange, but we were talking about this last time, you know, if I look at my hand mm -hmm. and I really don't think about it, like I just, it's kind of a nothingness until now I'm thinking about it and now it's a thing. So a pure experience is a kind of nothingness, right? Like when I just like look at this room and I don't think about it, like I really try to, it's the awareness stuff you're talking about. Like I really try to take it in. That is a kind of nothingness. But the moment I start talking, it goes away from that nothingness. I pull it back into kind of a, a solid thingness, which by the way, I have to do in order to give the room meaning. Otherwise the kind of the, uh, the pure experientiality can overwhelm me. Uh, so I have to put it into meaning. But it's interesting because we're talking about balancing ourselves with nothingness per se, or always co correcting our thinking or understanding the world with nothingness. We're talking, it's, it's not so abstract when you think of it as experience, right? Yeah. As you think of it as a kind of experience where thought and the problem is all we always in in, in this sense I, I i refer to it as a difference between thinking and perceiving like whenever we think we have to remember there's also that which we perceive the experiential that surrounds what we think and therefore the map is never the territory you know you hear that phrase right you know so thinking is always a map that is an abstraction of the territory and ideas are not experiences so thinking is always towards something it never reaches and it, therefore relative to thinking the world, the pure experience is a nothing, but it is not a nothing in, in perception, in pure perception. And the funny thing is to talk about I, so many of these, the great thinkers are often moving between thinking and perceiving and describing it as a nothingness relative to thinking, but relative to perception, it's an aesthetic beauty that's coming through. You know, there are different languages and it's like relative, right? Relative to thinking, you know, the, the pure hand is a nothingness that my idea of the hand needs to always exist in a dialectical tension to. So my idea does not, because when you, because what Nina Sashani and religion and nothingness understood is that in the West, we had an obsession with thinking to the point where we tried to have autonomous rationality as David Hume talks about pure thinking and that leads to nihilism because ultimately at the ground of life, um, thinking cannot be its own foundation. Thinking ultimately has to be founded by experience or perception. You, you know, it's like in math, how you have to have axioms, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, you know, so think, and I like to say that um, true and rational are different categories. And the, the, the example I always give a hundred times that people get bored of is that if I think it's going to rain today and I bring an umbrella, you know, is it rational to bring an umbrella? Absolutely it is. 
But let's say it doesn't rain. Does that mean I was irrational? No, I was wrong, but I was irrational. It is possible to be wrong and irrational because what was rational was relative to what I believed was true. But here's the trick. I could not determine what was rational until I decided what I thought was true. So the truth has to come before the rationality of which the truth itself cannot be purely constituted by rationality. But what in the West we've tried to do is think, no, 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 baby, we can do rationality all the way down because true and rational are similes. They're the same thing, but that's not the case. At the end of the day, truth has to be grounded in emotional, kinetic, spiritual, all these different sort of um, um, uh, yeah. methods of assist, ascension. But, but in the West, by us not thinking of that, we have attempted an autonomous rationality, which, which inevitably has led to tribalism, totalitarianism, Adorno, Horkheim, dialectics of the Enlightenment. And what so much of the Eastern thinkers are going is like, no, 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 no. No, you have to have a foundation of experience or perception or a absolute nothingness and then think based on that. But the West has not wanted to accept that. So we've had a lot of mistakes of conflating the rational and the true. And um, and so then to correct that, you almost in the West, because the emphasis has been so much on thinking, you have to emphasize nothingness to have thinking, have a kind of self-consuming mechanism. So it realizes that when it consumes itself and turns itself off, wait a minute, the world doesn't disappear. Like there's a question all the time, right? There's like, how do you know the world out there isn't a matrix? Like if you really think about that, that means you really have made a God of thinking. Like you're pretty much saying, how do I know the world stays out there? Like that is not just a matrix. Well, stop thinking and see if it vanishes. Like I'm there's a bookcase right here. I'm gonna stop thinking and see if it vanishes. <laughs> no, it didn't vanish, it's still there. <laughs> like, you know, the whole idea that thinking like makes the world yeah. um, suggests how obsessed we are with the myth of autonomous rationality of which actually has very severe socio-political consequences as I think David Hume, uh, Holkheimer and Adorno and all those people uh, yeah. traced out. Right. Let's just ask a question. Where does, in terms of perception, because I've been thinking about like one of the things that the Heidegger in his, in his book, this really struck me because it's, mm -hmm. it, it struck me because it, it, it spoke, it spoke to a tension I noticed I've had that I think that you've just outlined about this because it, because it often seems like for me, um, when I talk about philosophy and you usually people talk about philosophy, you usually think about people like heady people or something. Brains on sticks, yeah. right? Or, but, but I'm like, I'm like, I don't feel heady. I, it's like, it feels like I feel like philosophy for me has somehow more to do with perceiving. Like the more, the more I understand these things, the more I can actually behold and reach toward and grab and like, it's like, it's not about abstractions or something like that. Um, but. And then, and then Heidegger says in, in basic questions where he goes back and, and he talks about the, the transformation of the idea of thinking, right, from the pre-Socratics and Aristotle and, and, and Plato to the rational animal, right, before the rational animal where, where all of a sudden thinking becomes in the mind, something that this strange animal does in their head or something, that before thinking was, was almost synonymous with perceiving. Right. That it's like and I and I thought about this, but it but, but but what's also interesting about this, this, this thing we're Daniel and I were briefly talking about this yesterday. And it has to, I think it has something to do with Scully and it has something to do with this, this sense that that how how we somehow how how especially with time, the way I understand time, the way I hold time one recognizes that if you're really holding time, it's, it's the way that time is simultaneously holding you, right? There's this kind of, this quality of like, like the way I, yeah, the way I hold it mirrors the way I hold me. If I, if I, if I conceptualize time as a kind of linear time, right? Then all of the existential problems that I have will be mirrored in the way I experience time. And I feel, and, all, and, and that ends up being how time holds me is like not holding me or something like that. And so there's this kind of weddedness, and this is what I'm wondering about, this experience of how the, how the world, and you can hear this in Helen Keller too, right? Right, so where, where before she got water, like she's deaf, dumb and blind, right? So before she got water, she talks about there was no her, <laughs> there was no, uh, there, all there was was like a time, like no time, but just flashes oh. with no unity in it, right? Of pleasure and pain and, but no world. And then 
you know, the, the teacher put okay. her hand in water and marked water 8,000 times or whatever. At some point she said, she got water. When she got water, she got the world. She got her, she got the world. Like duh, 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 the whole, she could actually, things came into existence. The world came into perception. Yes. So, so uh-huh. this thing, there's this way where it's like, it's not so much that words or language um, describes what we already perceive. In some sense, the word allows the perception to come into being, right? But I don't know if that's actually, there's this kind of wettedness there. There's a wettedness. Um, You know, a few things. Um, One, so you have this ancient debate on the idea, I guess, where some people say, you know, if I was born deaf blind, you know, in a wheelchair and I couldn't sit, I'd be closer to the truth. And there's another sense that says, no, 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 if you could really see if blue was really more like blue, if the world was really more like the blue, almost like an end of Chronicles of Narnia kind of thing, then you'd be close to the truth. So you have this side where sense gets in the way of truth. And you have another side that says, no, in some respect, the truth is this sort of where blue is more like blue shapes more like there's a deepening of the world. And based on that debate, Walker Percy in his essay collection, uh, Message in the Bottle, uh, Delta Factor, I think, precisely claimed that that moment in Hella Keller should be of incredible philosophical significance to people. Uh, because, and he really writes a whole essay quite good on it in the Walker Percy about that, really examining the Hella Keller moment and saying, right here is a kind of answer to that debate. And what you see is that, no, 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 you don't have a deeper grasp of the truth if you have no sense whatsoever. That it's one, he's not saying that language doesn't matter because he thinks language is a big deal, but he's saying there has to be some sort of weddedness between language and phenomenon and that language doesn't get in the way of the world. What, what it seems to be is something where language by focusing in on the world and thus shrinking the world actually then gives it the possibility of getting a grasp of the world of which then opens you up to the full possibility of grasping the world. So no, I, I really think that Walker Percy and exactly what you're saying was very astute uh, to place so much philosophical significance on the Helen Keller moment. Second, you know, we all know about the great split between Plato and Aristotle and how the world was all shaped and so forth. There was actually another really big split that was hyper important. uh, And it was a split between David Hume and and Immanuel Kant. And there's this whole thing called the Scottish Enlightenment, which no one ever hears about. Uh, We only hear about the Enlightenment. But you see, um, what David Hume was doing is actually, you know, the Harold Bloom talks about how the history of thought tends to be the history of great misreadings. And uh, I would actually argue that Immanuel Kant terribly missed David Hume. Now I say that and people could have been in the German idolist class and you say, you monster. I'm not saying Kant was stupid. I'm not saying that. that I'm, I'm, I'm going. I'm no, leaving. <laughs> Oh, you go. Yeah, that's yeah, Scottish. Go. So this okay, is okay. You're going. Oh, we're going. We're good. We're good. Oh, so you know, <laughs> yeah, you know, if, uh, you think. I also think a lot of people separate. As a side note, Kant. You have to read all three critiques, and a lot of the negatives that people point out, like Quentin M. He's the French philosopher, where he talks about Kant and Lisa's fatalism and all that different stuff. Um, Actually, I think Kant was aware of that and he corrected it. He tried to correct it in the aesthetic in the third critique, and I have this paper called "Bridging the Constitutive Thing." But anyway, there's still a problem in that. In David Hume's human um, treatise of human nature, you know, he famously kind of says, oh, you can't prove causation. If I have a billiard ball going across and it hits another, you can never get to a law of nature. If the sun rises and I snap my fingers every morning when the sun rises, you would have to logically deduce that I can snap my fingers and make the sun come up. A lot of people think it's almost a Derridaian trickster where he's just kind of being a trickster and he's so different things. No, what he's trying to show you is that you, he is not saying causality doesn't exist. This is a terrible mistake. What he is saying is that your understanding of causality is primarily based on experience and custom. And then you add a philosophical dimension that the experience comes first and then you're putting it in philosophical and scientific terms to understand it. But the scientific theory in terms is not primary. It doesn't come first, it has to come second. The mistake of Kant, I think, is that he was thinking that David Hume was saying that all thought is no good and it's not valid. Really what David Hume wants to do Um, And it's really unfortunate because I don't think it's very clear. And I think Livingston's the best scholar on him. He makes a distinction between good philosophy and bad philosophy. And by bad philosophy, he means thinking unto thinking that is not embedded in a world or or that does not appreciate the role of experience in the world perception to think. And what David Hume says is you don't want to be so you have um, unphilosophical. You have bad philosophical and you have good philosophical. If you're unphilosophical, he warns, you're probably going to be taken advantage of by a dictator or somebody that comes in. It's almost like the Hannah Arden banality of evil. So you want to engage in philosophy. And it's almost like you go on a hero's quest. So what you do is you go on a philosophical journey. And what he says is the problem is most people stop at the quote unquote ivy tower. 
They go off into an abstract realm of thought and they stay there. And they like to stay there too, because they get a lot of like praise and social pressure and they don't have to, you know, go till the farm or something. But he says the good philosopher goes on the journey. And remember, you have to leave the common life. He refers it to common life because otherwise you're going to be exploited. You can't think for yourself. You'll be taken over. And then you fall into all the problems we were saying earlier. So you go on the journey. Most people, unfortunately, stop halfway on the journey where they begin philosophy, but they stay in pure philosophy. And he, and he absolutely warned, um, just like kind of, he really was ahead of Edmund Burke, that that would lead to totalitarianism and lead to a whole lot of problems. He was way ahead of Holkheimer and, and Adorno and all those people. So what the philosopher needs to do is then come back and embed themselves in a common life. So you want the philosophy, it's almost the Jefferson idea there's, of the- There's um, Wilkes tension or intensity, I think. There is, there is an intensity It's also there. the cave. It's, it's a journey, right? It's first out of the cave and then back, back into in. the cave because then you have freedom only when you yeah, go and back to Yeah, and what's so life. critical is I do think, you know, sometimes Plato can get beat on and I don't get me wrong, I can beat on Plato too. But the going back to the cave, people kind of take that to mean he shouldn't have gone back to the cave, but there's actually a tragic reading of that story. And I think Heidegger's reading of Plato is quite good with the playing different things. Um, but, uh, but that journey of going back and being embedded you're supposed to be the farmer while reading Ovid is kind of, that was the, you know, Jefferson and different people. And, you know, but, uh, but there's a lot of truth to that where then you embed yourself in life. Oh, and here's the key. David Hume says at the end of the day, the philosopher is to um, defer to the common life. You know, if tradition is X, and the philosopher has a lot of good arguments for why the tradition is bad, but not arguments to like 100% disprove it, then the philosopher gives the benefit to the doubt for what has been done for hundreds of years. Now, the risk there, of course, is, you know, your bigotry and that exists forever. But there's also it's like the Chesterton fence idea where if you come upon the forest and you see a fence and you're like, I don't know why that's there. You have two options. You say, well, I don't know why that's there. So I'm going to take it up and get rid of it. Now, Chesterton was like, dude, if you like, come upon a fence in the woods and you don't know why it's there. Don't be so quick to take it out, man. There might be a reason. So likewise, what can happen after you can, the, the bad philosopher for David Hume has a tendency to then try to remake the entire world in the image of what they think is best. And like, oh, those traditioners are old. They're behind the time. Oh, the thinking, your way of life is dumb. And you know, that embed, oh, you're just meditating all the time. We're trying, and what do you, what do you end up with? David Hume saw this. You end up with the, you know, the, the technology zeitgeist we have now. You end up with all yes. the Facebook stuff. This is better. Life is better now. You know, we're better now that we have the social media. Now there's a ditch on either side of the road, of course. And this is what the whole book Belonging Again is because people literally get embedded in like a common life. Then they don't have enough exposure to diversity. Then they get the banality of evil and they're a bunch of big, racist bigots, right? So you, that's the risk. But we act like, here's the problem. We act like there's no risk to the other side. We ask, we act like there's no risk to pure technical progressive thinking and technology will save the day. No, man, you have the, um, you have the totalitarianism, despotism of the past and you have it of the future. And I think so many of these great thinkers are trying to find a balance between those things. And I think Heidegger was extremely aware of it. David Hume was extremely aware of it. And it's just a little unfortunate. I think that Kant, um, I don't think Kant read it correctly. Now, I, don't, I haven't written that paper. You know, maybe there's a, a, a letter somewhere to a friend where he clarified, actually, you know, this is what David Hume mean. I need to go rewrite and then he died or something. I, you know, so I, I'm not, I'm not sure, but, but that tension is important. Right, 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 right. Interesting. You know, it kind of reminds me of the philosophical experiment that Rilke said about fate, where he said, we're like dice in a cup, right? And there's this invisible hand that jostles us out onto the, onto the you know the surface right he goes but the thing is eventually you get put back into the cup and all the possibilities lie within there right you're not a specific number you're not anything you're still within the cup within all the realms of possibility so it's like this this thing where it's like you're thrusted out there and then you're shoved back into the cup where everything is returned and all possibility remains open and i think that's kind of very similar to what you're saying there og words where it's like this this thing where it's like the danger lies in me trying to determine um, with me being already thrusted onto the surface, but I should return back into the, into the cup and, and lie in all the possibilities. And I told Johannes the other day, I was like, you know, when I write a poem or when I think of something every day and every morning, I have to give that up and write something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I, I experienced the mournful loss for a couple of moments and then I create something new again. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's this, uh, it's what makes life more, more alive. And I always tell people, you know, when, when people want to ground on life, I was like, the ground that you want 
you want a dead ground because even in science, the ground is actually not dead. Right, there's tectonic uh, shifting. The world is always rotating. So the ground that we're in is always pulsing and breathing. The thing is, are we mistaking a very momentary pulse of the ground as the definition of the ground itself? Mm. Right. If I were to count my own pulse and go, "Ooh, that that big boom, that's me," is it, or is it all the ripples and series that encompass me? Right. So. That's the problem when I see the fence in the, you know, in the division is like, okay, is this just a glimpse of what, of a small frame of what I am catching on to? Mm. Um, and, and I think that's, <laughs> I, I try to try to tell this to, I guess, people that don't read philosophy, but it's very hard. You can see the fear in their eyes and like, oh my God, I've, <laughs> my, my, my whole ground has been taken away if I, if I disprove or something to them or something. You know? and, and just to add very quickly to your point, what David Hume understood is that the bad philosopher goes somewhere and takes an impulse of life and says, this is life. And then they force it upon everyone else because they don't have a common life or a way of life to check and balance themselves. And the bad philosopher is also the person who doesn't want to engage with the world with care because they don't want to, in, they want to keep it in that infinite possibility. But what is the infinite possibility? nihilism the it's not the good nothing it's the completely destructive so that's how like that it all goes together where the the, the good philosopher chooses a way of life they choose a way of life and they hold it with care. And they also don't look at it and say, my idea of how the world to be is better than this. And they're always deconstructing of it and criticizing it. No, they embed themselves in it. They accept it. They humbly accept it. And then they live in a state of care with that life that they choose and they embed themselves in. Yeah. Right. Right. So interesting. So interesting. The, um, you know, I'm thinking about, so, so I'm thinking about just this back into the beginning of the conversation we were talking about what you were saying um, about the, the, this, this, this Heidegger, well, I, it, it, in, it, he actually talks about this throughout, but he, it, the emphasis changes a little bit, but Heidegger's notion of being in, being in time about authentic authenticity, right, is in some sense what I, I heard in you, like with the, with the anxiety, right. Is that you, is, is you, yeah. Is you step in and you actually, in some sense, take a stand. But my understanding in like, in like being in, in being in time is that you, you take a stand knowing that there's, there's no place from which to justify your stand. Right. That's and right. that like, when you stop, and I heard this is like, when you stop expecting the ground, if, like the ground to be given in something other than you are taking a stand on the ground, being held up by surrounding. <laughs> it's like, the, yeah. like, it's like the nothing surrounds and it becomes the necessary tension that holds your concern is all the people saying, mm -hmm. you suck, right? And you're like, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. But this kind of this way of like, I'm wondering, it, it, is, your, is your reading of Heidegger similar? about that with the, especially because oh, he's talking about anxiety, right? The mood of anxiety reveals, makes possible the signs taking the stand and- now, now this is where I'm going to like go on on my limb. Um, you know, the image I always have in mind when I read um, Heidegger is that image in Tolstoy's diary where he talks about having a dream and he's held up by a string over a void. And there's nothing all around and he finds it completely terrifying. It's one of his diaries where he talks about this, where you're just kind of held up and it's kind of this terrifying moment. And there's something about where the, um, the good night, I guess the Nietzschean good nihilism is someone who can accept that. Now, what, now there's another question though that emerges is um, that I'm interested in is that going to work for the average person? And does that even work for us, <laughs> you know, from a standpoint? Or is it like, I don't know, man, that's a little dark, kind of like the Tolstoy thing. And this is where, for me, I'm very interested in beauty, because in the Tolstoy's I mean, there is a string holding them up. I think that there's not a ground underneath you, but there might be something that you can ascend toward in a sort of Dante way, sort of a beauty. I think this is where art plays a big role. And I think that's kind of why Heidegger was getting into poetry toward the end. And I think he started kind of going, all right, the being of being... What does that look like? What is the kind of ground? And there's something like a movement for me uh, because I don't think it's 100% clear, but to me, I, I write about something called the fate of beauty, which is the idea that um, 
uh, what we find beautiful kind of, there's the aesthetic experience of what we find beautiful. Even if we can't have a ground on, underneath us, there might be something to be said because what is it like to experience beauty? To experience beauty is to experience, it feels something transcendent of you, but it's also not something you can fully grasp. And it's also something that you're not standing on, but heading toward. So there's a change in the directionality. Um, so I think I do completely agree that Heidegger is talking about this ability to find authenticity with nothing underneath you. But then there is a question of, can the average person or can any of us, you know, practically maintain that sort of way of thinking and keep it from becoming nihilism versus absolute nothingness if there isn't a positive sort of um, pull in a different direction. So that's why I get very interested in beauty because there's always that idea, right? Where if you like remove something, it's like if God is dead, what's going to fill the void, right? You know, well, there's a problem because if you fill the void, then is it a new God and you don't want to do that. So maybe it's more like, you know, you don't fill the void, but you look up uh, and, and not though, but then it's a question of how do you keep that from being escapism? How do you keep that from being a sort of running away? And that's where you get the whole paper on beauty. And then I talk about how aesthetics leads to ethics and different things like that. So to your point, yes, I think Heidegger, well, I just said my day. I think Heidegger's image is kind of that Tolstoy image that you see in his diary. And then the question becomes, because we ask this, practically speaking though, how is that going to work for us? You know, what about for different people? You know, et, et cetera, and, and so forth. Right. And I mean, to your point, that's also what all the socio my favorite sociologies are interested in. I mean, like sociologically speaking, givens are gone under pluralism. You, you know, a given is something where you wake up and you don't have to think about it. It's just given that everyone's a Christian. It's just given that everyone goes to that. You don't think about it. It's a thoughtlessness. But here's the thing. It's not stupid. It's thoughtless. Thoughtless and stupid are not similes. And in fact, if you have too much thinking, you go crazy, right? You want some level of given so that you're not overwhelmed every single day. It's like Cornel West talking about how he wears the same outfit every day because he doesn't want to have to think about what he's going to wear. He doesn't want to have that mental exhaustion, right? So sociologists talk about how we're losing the background and increasing the foreground. We're losing givens, but we're also increasing individual possibility. But with that increase of individual possibility, that's, of course, a, fir a first world problem more so. And that's where people like Freud and Jung realized that psychoanalysis was almost inherently privileged. But the problem is precisely because there was inherent privilege to it, people would disregard it and not think it matters. But those problems are really real. And it actually has hurt us to call them first world problems, because then we think they're stupid problems. When no, let me, depression's pretty bad. You know, <laughs> depression's pretty bad. And so we almost need new metaphors. It's like Susan Suntang talks about, you know, metaphors matter, right? And the metaphors of illness construct how we do now. Like we have first world problems, second world problems, third world problems. I think that I think has hurt us because then we don't take seriously the mental stuff, the mental health issues or different things. We're like, well, at least you can eat, yeah. right? Well, we, I don't, well, I don't want to eat because I don't want to be alive or something, right? It doesn't matter. So, you know, so I think a lot of the sociologists are talking about that. And I think Heidegger is a philosophical understanding of why that's happening on the individual. And then you get into your Philip Reeves, your Peter Berger, your James Hunter and different things. And the question is, how do we move forward? You know, how do we move forward and stop having a million conspiracy theories, you know, movements of popularism, totalitarianism and things like that. And for me, beauty plays a role. This is where paradox, it's so, so interesting. I keep thinking about like, I keep thinking about this experience of, for some reason I keep thinking about this, about this experience of circling over and over and over and over and over and over again. Just like this of where, what seems to be so important for people, right? And this is striking to me. I don't know exactly what's going on here, with this, but it, it seems something other than just psychological. It seems to be, I've concluded, I've just seen it so universally true is that, and it doesn't even, it's so funny. It doesn't even matter if somebody is happy or not happy or something like that. When they have this experience of deeply being gotten, it's like this existential relief that they don't even know that they were wanting it so deep. But when they experience, it's like this, oh my God, like yeah. Oh, yeah. I find, I've never even asked for this. But I've been looking for it my whole life, this kind of experience of being gotten. And I, and I was thinking about, well, what, when does that usually happen, right? And I think what it usually happens is for most of the time, it's not getting what they say, right? It's often actually has nothing to do with what they say. In fact, that's the thing it, it seems to presuppose that to get them is to not get what they're immersed in, but in some say it elucidates some paradox that they're in some unresolvable thing and that they can't not but care about, but they can't ever get a grip around this, this kind of, um, and I'm starting to kind of hear this of like, oh, and I'm, is there something, be it's an experience of beauty. Yes. They get their own beauty, but there's, so I'm, I'm hearing this whole, I'm kind of hearing about this whole thing about paradox and anxiety. And now that you're bringing in this whole thing about, 
you know, um, the first order problems yeah. and psychology yes. and, but this experience of beauty yeah. and tension and the struggle. Yeah. You know, that that's, that's why I kind of like connected circling with Scully in a weird way, because you told me that, right. It, sometimes in these, these dialogical situations, when, when that kind of suchness, so that when someone feels I am accepted as I am, yeah, just just as in my being as I am, yeah. and when that sounds through, that's so deeply meaningful for people, yeah. right? And that's also I think that's then where this 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 inexhaustible beauty shines through, and that that's often right what Viveki and Nishitani talk about. Yeah. Because when you're in your mode of suchness, which you reach perhaps also in Scolé, because I think through this, this kind of like experience of moreness, mm. and then suchness is just, it cannot be further reduced. It's non written than the abyss. It's non-grounded. Mm. It, it, it penetrates through all grounds. Mm. It's, it's indeterminable in a sense. Yeah. That's this as it isness, but that's also... That's also beauty in a sense, I think. And that's so that's that's then that way in Scolé, let's say, that way then is also not just how we human beings but are disclosed in our suchness, but also other beings. Yeah. And we can accomplish right, we, we can accomplish that with agape. That's why for Veiki, right? Agape yeah. is that is that kind of love that enables person making. And I think that when when we can realize each other as persons, we also realize each other in in our suchness, yeah. which is always inexhaustible, which is always more. That's why all ethical traditions try to like try to safeguard that that there's this divine there's this divine found in human being in a sense, and that there's there's even in the in the worst criminal there's this divine spark that's always going beyond in a sense. Um, hmm. And right, all, all religions, all religious traditions try to safeguard that in a sense. Yeah. Hmm. Um, and and when we don't have that, then it, it's it's just how we also treat other beings. All these things, then right, that Heidegger talks about the they they are withdrawing, and we we the, 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 we, we talk about right the the famine in a sense, the the the, the, the meaning crisis. Because if we have, if we can realize and, 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 and beings disclose themselves to us in the mode of suchness, then there's also this overabundance of meaning and intelligibility. Hmm. Kind of like what enables that seems to be Scolé, something like Scolé. Yeah. That, that that can, a... that in which we can agapically participate. And then it's, then it, it's kind of like, then we are holding us or shepherding us in that in that that newly awakened possibility space or we space right that that's that's what what we call it with that these guys from germany the awakened we space in which we participate but then also kind of like we, we look through through it yeah so it's always vibrating and 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 disclosing something more to us we look through it and in looking through it are conformed by it yes 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 right? there's this deep participation yeah. when we real when we are real co-realizing it yeah but you know it, it reminds me of how like e even eric Fromm talks about this and R rilke talks about this as well mm -hmm. how if we could just withdraw for a moment we would realize our own eternity within ourselves and and it and with everything you're saying daniel it's like People get anxiety because there's all these expectations and external grasping. But th there's <laughs> this momentary understanding of your fullness overcomes all that exists in terms of anxiety, expectations, sorrow, mourning, um, meaninglessness. It's just like this exuding um, fragrance of fullness that to even say that you're sacrificing yourself is a lie because there's actually nothing to be sacrificed because there's so much givenness that it, it is constantly renewing itself. Um, and there is nothing to, 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 um, that is taken away. 
there's nothing that is taken away. And, and it's funny because it's hard explaining this concept to people because in friendships and love and everything, and Rilke really talks about this, he goes, we destroy the concept of love and the concept of friendship and the concept of beauty. And we disillusion ourselves because we come into some kind of expectation and we think we must tear away from ourselves and say, yes, this is love. I'm giving you this of myself and you must treat it with care and caution and beauty. But the thing is, if you have such exuding fullness, you receive, you're always receiving. There is never a time that you're not receiving. And, and it's like, it's so hard to explain this concept, um, but there's just never a time that you're not receiving and there's never a time that you're not giving. It's just the very presence of myself and the beauty of the other person and their presence that we are always giving and we're always receiving. It's just a matter of realigning and aligning that two objects together, aligning them in that way um, to see that. <laughs> and it's like the hardest thing to explain to people because they're like, what do you mean? Um, I have a kind of fullness within myself. What does this even mean? What is this depth that we're talking about? And I think this is why solitude matters. And I have to question what we mean by social animals, because sometimes I often think we make the mistake of saying, oh, well, social creatures means I must always interact with other beings. But I would like to change that because even silence is very social. Silence is very, very social thing, a social existence. Even my own emotions become existent beings within myself that I must become social with and entertain their existence um, to which I then I'm always now um, exuding this fullness. So um, yes, Daniel, I, I 100% agree <laughs> what you're saying. I, I just thought of, right, um, Rilke has this, where the rose blossoms without the wire. So this is this famous um, um, poem, right? Um, and this is the, the, the same people love that because it, it just shows us that you can, there's never a why. So there's never a ground at which you stop. It penetrates through, through all grounds. It's inexhaustible in that sense. And this is you, you never stop. And, and that, that's, that's, that's why this no thingness is such a radical and, and kind of like unfathomable idea because you never stop. <laughs> Did it, um, Right, where Veiki put it in his series, there's a there's a fecundity, there's this transframing, and there's a fecundity at the level of in, in no thingness that this transframing will never stop. Yeah, well, it's also it you know, always the, goes on. Exactly, and here's the tricky part: is you never stop. Yeah, it's like like you don't even get to stop. <laughs> you just like is there still there's still there's still a there's still a tautness in there, right? It's not a just an infinity, right? It's like there's a there's a there's a limitation in there. This kind of tautness that pulls you back, right? This kind of and so I, this is what I'm getting the sense of this 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 is so interesting, like because it is really true. It's like getting people this thing about paradox that you're saying in anxiety. It's just so the moment you care is just, there's something about that that's just so illogical on every every regard. When you kind of take it to, you think it, if you think about it, like you can think enough to where things just don't make sense, but that the very fact of your thinking already announces that you already find yourself caring in which your thought is like a response to that, right? So there's this kind of like this constant, yeah, there is this constant moreness, right? But there's also something that pulls you back in realizing the groundlessness that you're on. <laughs> it's like this, this kind of sense. This is why I think it's kind of people are just, it's, it's, I, I think philosophers are basically, this is what I think philosophers and just deep people are like this. That's all they're doing. They're just going like, do you hear that? That's all they're doing. <laughs> That's all we're doing right now. We're like, hear that sound i can't tell if it is that far away or is that or is that like somehow behind my eye where is that is that really close or is that far you hear that <laughs> uh oh 
streaming. But my children are streaming that. Oh. <laughs> I told them not to. It's messing up the internet. <laughs> Mr. Rose, Mr. Rose, Mr. Rose, a teacher. Uh, he teaches a uh, piano, uh, <laughs> but yeah, what's his this? What's his connection here? Is he? I, I've never met him before. I've never seen him before. So I, I, I believe I brought him in. I, um, ah, I, he's what? Yeah. Okay. He's one of the. He's one of the people that don't count when you say. It's so hard for people to understand this. <laughs> which you always say so quite people are to, to hear this <laughs> you always say that when you're talking about your We're back right did i get kicked off it came off one of them yeah no this is not captured by tech daniel your interconnection is still very I'm here am i here Am I here? Well, are you are here? My back. That's what we're that trying to me. talk about. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. Okay, I hear you now. I'm so sorry. That's weird. It dropped me out. Okay. Well, that was me intentionally sabotaging the video so I'm not captured by technology. You know, I thought that was a good idea. So, you know, I was listening to Heidegger or something like that. Um, well, I was so you can hear me now. I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, you know, a lot of what you just so, you know, part of the problem has been that we have had the A equals A as the foundation of our thinking. Um, as you know, which was a logical principle from Aristotle, but is translated into an ontological principle. And you see what ends up happening is if we get A is A, we get like a point, A is A, it's a point, but it's not going anywhere. Um, but another mistake can be where you say A equals B, and then you got like a line going off in outer space and it's not going anywhere, and that's not good. And really what you want is something more like A, A slash B. Not where it equals B, but it's a slash. And then it's a series of circles going around a point, right? So, you know, likewise, we, I don't think we want to say I equals we, but we want to say I slash we, right? We want to don't say we're a single thing, but we want to have like a slash as opposed to an equal. Now you can use, I mean, Cato Lash will say A equals B and he means all this. Um, but one of the, the things is I think um, to not go into the paper, I try to make an argument where ontologically we are A slash B, not A equals A or A equals B. Therefore, the question is, what practices can we undergo that is going to make us connect with our A slash B ontology as opposed to practices that reconfirm falsely in A is A ontology? Because what ends up happening if A is A is true? Then I am a complete system. And what does a complete system not do? Expand, grow include other people. Yeah. So you have this problem where A is A thinking leads us to going, I am complete. Well, then there's no expansion. And so we have all of these different practices, whether it be meditation, rather it be the thinking of Heidegger, rather it be, you know, dwelling on absolute nothingness, well, rather it be art, of which are practices that maybe for some practices, some are better than others, that gets us attuned with a A slash B-ness, that is going to make us more attuned to our ontology. So we are not a complete system, but we're also not random because you can't have this mistake system of saying we don't exist at all. Well, that's a mistake because that would be A equals B. So, so A is A would be completeness. That's a mistake because there is no completeness ontologically. A equals B would be a contradiction. And a contradiction is not a paradox. You do not want a contradiction because that is a negation. And so you don't want to have a philosophical practice of contradiction. What you want is a philosophical practice of paradox because that is going to get you in tune with your paradoxical ontology. And then you feel what? Recognized. I'm recognized. You know me. You were talking about Ole. Ole means God. You know, God, God. You know, you throw up your hands like, yes, you know who I am. And the experiences of beauty, I think, are, you know, I really like focusing on those because I think they might work for the majority, um, is because an experience of beauty is of something that's here and not here. It's something greater than yourself, but it's something there. It's something that exists in this between space of subjectivity and objectivity that has this kind of A slash B characteristic. And that's where I think it has an ability when these experiences of being got, of being understood, yeah. tend to be experiences that feel beautiful and they resonate with your A slash B ontology. Yeah. And it, you're like, yes, I'm, I'm not just an A equals A. I'm not just complete in myself. And you see what's interesting is we think we want to be complete in ourselves. We think we want to be an A is A. Autonomous rationality in the West has said that is the goal, but we're actually not happy yeah. because once we're complete, we're finished. 
We're done. We're dead. Yeah. Um, and what we actually want is a kind of, um, cause this is what all the, you know, incomplete with the I N in parentheses where we are in the completeness incomplete, yeah. this kind of double accent. And that's a dialectic. So a is a is completeness. That's a mistake. A equals B is a contradiction. It's an opposing of opposites dialectic, which is not a real dialectic. And a slash B is a real dialectic that has a parentheses incompleteness that has an ever growingness where you're circling out from a point consuming more people And agape love is good. Cause what are you doing? You're saying I slash we, Right. You're not saying I equal we you're saying I slash weed. I am pointing. I am bringing more people into myself. Mm. I'm bringing you to this point. And so I'm not lost. Mm. So you don't want an A, B because then you're just going out of space. So what you is your point and you're ever circling around that point with yeah. bigger circles. Now, you want to make sure your circles are getting bigger. You know, if you're just doing circles around the point, but it's staying there, then you don't feel like you're growing. You're not making the mistake of A is A, but you're not advancing. Uh, and then you can actually get a new A is A because you're complete in that circle. So you create a new A is A. So you always have to make sure the circle is expanding to stay in an A slash B way of life, as opposed to some error of completion or some error of contradiction. That's, by the way, that, that I, I have this book on, on Meister Eckhart and Releasement or Gelassenheit. Um, there's, there's very similar. It's like... Um, there's this sentence in Eckhart, right? Um, um, what is it? So therefore, let us pray to God that we become void of God. Yeah, yeah. Or even in Zen, you find this, like, when you have attained enlightenment, let go. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, so many of the mystics had a sense of this. They have a double action. Like they say, you have to let go of your sense of lowercase g God in order to be open to uppercase yes. g God. You know, this kind of lowercase uppercase. All the mystics had a sense of this. One of the big... Um, unfortunate developments of the waning of religion is we've also lost that mystical, philosophical, theological train of thought, if you will. I think people like Wittgenstein understood how important it was. That's why he's like, he said, the limits of the language are the limits of my world, but it's very, very important. He was not saying that that's all there is, right? He was saying, you know, it's kind of like, what's well, really funny. I always like to say, you know, it's not a thing in life. Well, we're not a thing in life either. Uh, you know, so we have to integrate that into ourselves. Wittgenstein loved the mystics. He was a very good thinker, but unfortunately, um, you know, I, he died too early. I think he was going to, some of his later works would have been very, very interesting in the same way. Yeah. How amazing would it have been if, you know, Nietzsche was going to go read Kierkegaard, right? And then he died. How crazy would have things been if Nietzsche actually read Kierkegaard? Because he loved Dostoevsky. Like when he ran into Dostoevsky, he's like, dude, I didn't know Christians could be this way. Like if he would have ran into a robust <laughs> Yeah. mystical Christianity, it would have been very, very interesting. I, you know, not that I'm saying he would have accepted it. It would have just been interesting to get the mystical Antichrist as opposed to the Antichrist, right? Maybe we got a really interesting, you know, atheist uh, critique against mysticism. But there is something about the mystical, whether we go to St. Gregory, which we get into origin, rather we go, you know, I was, we, we've had a reading group on confessions forever. You know, you get into the end of the confessions on St. Augustine on searching memory. There's something about memory. You know, how do I have a memory? Where do I find it? You know, all of these sort of paradoxical actions and the loss of theology and mysticism from some philosophy has contributed to going in an A equals A direction. Yeah. That doesn't mean all of mysticism was right, but the loss of it has contributed to the mistake of autonomous rationality. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Right. Right. Interesting. Actually, most people don't even know that mystical sides exist. I mean, I, it's, it's actually crazy because yeah. um, when, when people talk to me about religion, they always are referring to an exoteric side of religion. They don't even know that an esoteric side exists. Um, and so I always, I always have to question, I'm like, what do you mean by religion and what kind of framework of religion are you coming from? But even Slayer Marco would say, you know, religion is just a feeling, right? He's just, you know, religion is just a feeling. It's not anything else. Your idea of religion is actually something self-constructed. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, well, so unfortunately, is this is an example where politics has poisoned everything, right? You know, everyone's framework is thinking of religion as conservative social beliefs, right? I mean, this, this is where politics, you know, you can get into a whole discussion. One of the reasons philosophy in general in, is important is frankly to fight the creeping of politics to do your thinking for you. That's not saying politics is bad. No one's saying that. It's a necessary thing. We, unless you want to get into anarchism, baby. I mean, I got some social anarchism over here. We, we can talk about, right, you know, or communitarianism. But there's something about politics that has a tendency to do your thinking for you. It's like a secondhand smoke. It's like you're sitting in a restaurant eating and you catch the smoke of other people. If you do not actively engage in some sort of philosophy, you're going to catch it. And like everyone's like always panicking now. The world's always going to end, right? And you have to talk about every political issue and whatever. And like you want to, you know, you, you want to go tend your garden like Voltaire said 
said, well, you're a bigot and a monster and we're all going to die and you need to fight. And you, and you have all these people that are like getting up to fight for something and don't even know how to because they haven't thought about it. And that's, a, and that's the other problem. So they don't know how to do leisure well. They feel bad about then eating barbecue chips on the, on the chair. So they want to be active, but then they haven't thought about how to be active. And so they go out on the streets and like riot on the Capitol or something, right? Or they burn, like, you know, they're like, they're protesting the Capitol like you saw in January. So like, that's another unintended consequence of, leisure, of not doing leisure well is you're either going to get, you're either eating barbecue chips on the couch or whatever and watching Netflix, which is a stereotype, I understand, or you're trying to save the world without ever like thinking about like the way to do it or how to save your own community or your own family or your own self. And, and that reminds me to close that really good part in the Brothers Karmosov where the guy is confessing to Father Zosima and he says something like, you know, Father Zosima, I confess, I loved humanity and I lost the ability to love an individual. You know, Father Zosima, I confess, I loved humanity and lost the ability to love an individual. And what it's talking about is one of the big things that good philosophy, to use David Hume's language, does is to fight the temptation to love humanity instead of loving actual people, to fight the temptation to love the world instead of loving an actual place that you're in, you know, to love the actual world you're in as opposed to your idea of what the world is. And arguably, Love in its truest sense is a movement from your idea of something to what it actually is. But since whatever it actually is, is always greater than what you think it is, you have to always be that white. Yeah. Yeah. Dang. Oh, he's avoiding capture again. Or, yeah, yeah. Uh, YouTube, opposed- YouTube offended. You, you offended YouTube. <laughs> I did. It went out again. So I was saying, you know, like, I know I ascended it, right? So I was saying like love, did you get the love stuff? You know, I was saying where love is to move beyond your idea of someone to who they truly are in an ever expanding circle Mm -hmm. where you're going, which is then a tension because you're heading towards something you never arrive at, but it's a tension that moves you forward Mm -hmm. as opposed to an anxiety that paralyzes you in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so I really like, I really, I really like this. It, it's also that, that sense of think, think about that idea of when they talk about, when they talk about when you speak to a crowd, you actually can't speak to a crowd. You can only speak to one person. So like, it's, re- this is really true. If you've ever like taught or anything like this, it's like, you try mm-hmm. to speak to the whole thing. Yeah, like you can't, you actually can't really talk to to a crowd but if you do focus on one person at a time and you switch it around it's like you actually get a sense of the whole through that one person right and it yeah, grounds is, the whole the whole thing and this is this really, is where imaginary friends are helpful this is where imaginary friends are helpful because you can just talk to your imaginary friend I'm sorry, but you're saying <laughs> no you're right <laughs> <laughs> yes totally totally but this thing about so scole this kind of way so so I want to just read a couple of things and 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 look at this is this kind of this I I actually don't think you can translate scole the more I'm looking at it I don't think leisure covers it I don't think idleness covers it because you have to get you have to get that it's about time <laughs> like like you have to get it, it's about time it's so that, that holding aspect also time. also disappears right yeah. That's kole and echein. These so echein is just holding in Greek to hold. Yeah. The, the, that that shared root word yeah. disappears. But I, but I, I think you're right, Dan. What you because I've been as I've been look writing this article about this, I'm like, I keep pre- I keep pressing up against it. And I'm like, no, I don't think you can just make a translation of skole be, because you have to because all these later words like come come with this different sense of time right you have to you have to kind of get into the time that they're talking about and it's interesting because i think it's it's it is this pinnacle um place where yeah it's like where the ends and the means are there is no process going on like there's these there are these practices and they're not even the practices the practices are in scole right they talk they talk about like you know, do mathematics in Scole, right? Um, Because this is the thing I was trying to get at with in my article is is that I start the article out talking about Scole, which is making this presentation that, that what are we practicing when we circle, right? Like, I think people would usually say, well, we're practicing better doing something better. Like, 
all you, having something more, some, some more or less of something, something that you can kind of objectify at some level. But I don't think that's actually what, I don't think that covers people's experience of why, of why they, what they actually practice. I think what they're, they're exercising at its best is they're practicing scole. They're practicing dwelling in a different kind of time, right? Um, and so it, I just want to read some a summary. And this is by, I found one, so interesting. I found one book that actually talks about scole as scole and not as these other things. Um, and she summarizes, and I wrote them down here in the article. I'll just read them off. You can kind of hear this. Um, she summarizes the basic philosophical thinking at the time of Greece of scole. And she says, um, one is scole is the actualized condition at the apex of human aspiration. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. Plato argues that in Scole, we can know the essence of things. Um, we can know the essence of things. And in this state, we come to know the essence of ourselves. She says, Scole is morally free of service to anything. More, Scole is morally free of service to anything. It has no instrumental purpose for some X. Rather, in contrast, quote, we speak of leisure as the opportunity to choose and consume goods which are to our personal liking. However, in Scole, nothing in it is consumed because there, are, there, there is no process occurring in it. Like eyesight or hearing, it is functionally complete consumating and not consuming. I thought that was really good. It's confirming in this, this deep sense, you're confirming beings and beings confirm you. And, and perhaps you can even play with it. We con so we, you give each other a firmness to mm. your being. Yeah, yeah. So this kind of, so it's like, it's interesting. And I think that the, in, in I, um, Evo does a great job in, in that his introduction in, um, in the principles of philosophy where he says, it's not, it's like, it's not, whereas leisure is like an end, it's the end of kind of succession of linearity, right? Once the work's done, then leisure, right? Da -da -da -da. But it looked at, looked at in terms of time, scole is in some sense, it is the end that's always, always in front first. It's always in view. And it's always, it's what gives everything sense and direction. So the, the sense of time, right? I.e. the direction of time is the end that's always arrives first, right? So it's always in view. And therefore scole, practices of scole in some sense are these points where it's like, you know, you can think about the meditation, the observer, observer, whoop, no, you know, the, 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 <laughs> right, right. And I, and I thought about this, the, the sense in which you're just saying that you're talking about this really great that the A slash B, mm -hmm. right. And that, that in some sense, like if you, if you hold that paradox and you don't expect A to be A and you don't expect it to be A against A, yes. but you, you expect A slash B and, and you expect that, you know, now we're, now we're getting into this expecting paradox. And this is very similar to the end, the unresolvable end, having giving everything direction towards the unresolvable and giving the direction. You, you can start to feel this, this circling spiral yeah. happening. Scully. Well, and I always associate school, um, uh, you know, I always assess it with the Mikkel. He's that's he talks about flow, um, you know, the creative flow that you have and you find yeah. rest in that flow. Yeah. Uh, and that's where you're really engaged in an activity uh, where you're outside of time. Um, I, you know, so I accessorate the highest leisure is found in flow. And, uh, you know, flow is something I also brings me to beauty because it tends to be this kind of um, sort of practice. Uh, where you're aesthetically towards something like it's what the artists do. They talk about being in the flow state and that's when they're happiness, but it's not just sitting down. Right. It's where you kind of, and also, so, so true leisure is found in flow. 
And the thing that flow does is make your life feel like it has a story. You know, so flow, you find leisure and rest and feeling like your life is in a story, which you can rest in that story. There's sort of a storiedness to being that gives your life a meaning, but also not a meaning that is like a meaning that you have to prove to other people. And it's also something you participate in, but not just by sitting there. Because if you had a novel where the character sat on a couch, you'd be like, Okay. And you put it back on the shelf. Uh, So, you know, you want some sort of action. And also what makes a good story, some degree of tension, some degree of activity, some degree of obstacle, what flow in flow, people cannot get into the rest of flow. And when they're in flow, they feel like they're outside of time, but they cannot do it if they don't have an objective. If they don't have a goal, if they don't have something they have to overcome or to yeah. do. And also, too, when you're, tr- you're in that flow state, you're also looking for resources. You're expanding beyond yourself because you feel like the border between you and the world shatters. That's something that's really talked about. I think chapter four, getting into the flow state of flow, or maybe that's creativity. One of those books where he talks about that. So there's so many principles in flow. So we, I just finished a paper where it's talking about flow over form, where I want to replace the Platonic um, Plato's idea of form as the foundation of ontology for flow as a foundation of ontology. Right. And I think that's quite you know good because also too, I like it because let's say you're standing in a river, you know, and the river is going, think it because it's when you reach down and you cup the water and you can examine it and then you put it back in the river. So you have that double action. You don't want to have just river because then it's flowing and you don't have the ability to solid it. But I, I kind of like, because form also sounds like a statue, like it's solid yeah. and you can't, like if you take a hammer and you hit the statue, the rocks fell yeah. off and you can't really put it back without the rocks falling out, it doesn't work too well. And since metaphors matter, we want a good metaphor because they, because metaphors shape thinking like Neil Postman and I.A. Richards talk about. So you remember you pull it, you can look at it, you examine, you can reflect it and you can put it back in. You also need to pull it out to drink it and to stay alive. Um, so I think we need flow at the foundation of our um, metaphysical thing thinking, which also, of course, is inherently time bound. It takes time seriously, but also it has a unity through time as opposed to form. Now, of course, you can turn flow into form by lifting it out of the water, and that's not inherently bad, but then you can also drop form back into flow, whereas statues don't really turn into rivers very easily. Um, And so I like, you know, I like getting that metaphoric order correct. So I think I think true rest is found in flow. Um, The other thing that's messed us up in the West is our understanding of the word Sabbath, you know, where we had God rested on the seventh day. So we have this idea that you're supposed to rest. The word and N.T. Wright is very good on this. The word rest is actually God sits down on his throne to rule. It does not mean he like takes a nap. You have this idea that God takes a nap on Sunday. So everyone eats their chicken and takes a nap in the afternoon on Sunday. That's not what the Sabbath means. Sabbath is found in the state of um, ruling over, but ruling also does not mean dominate. It's more like stewardship and it's more like having a sense of wholeness. It's like, yes, it's finished. Now I'm going to sit and admire it and I'm going to like take care of it. Then you have the Garden of Eden where they're taking care of. It's very important in the Garden of Eden, there is work. There's not toil, but there is work. That's very important. Toil does it. The word for toil does not exist till after the fall, but they have to name the animals. They have to take care of the garden. There is, in fact, work. Human beings are not happy if they don't have work. So you have to have a conception of leisure that incorporates work, but not toil. And that's found in flow. And in flow, you have a rest, which is a sense of and also in flow, you have a sense of I can do this. I can do whatever the task is. I can do it. It's not overwhelming you. It's it's not so um, unchallenging that it's boring, but it's also not so challenging that you feel like you can't do it. And that is the state of God resting on the Sabbath. Resting is like, I can do this. You know, I don't need to dominate. And I can also have community. What does God do? He walks in the garden with human beings. He walks with them. I'm going to commune with them. And therefore that's the dot incorporating the we, the agape love right there. Um, so I think another thing that has really killed our understanding of leisure is the translation of Sabbath into nap. Uh, the translation of taking a nap, because that's not what rest means. The whole construction of Genesis is, um, and N.T. Wright again is good on this, and um, I guess Crozac and different, you know, is that it's actually the construction of a temple. The universe is constructed like a temple. If you follow the order and you compare it to other parts of the Torah, it's like a a temple is being built, and then God rests in that temple, the Holy of Holies and different things like that. So I think what's also hurt the West is our conception of quote-unquote Sabbath. You know, Marcel Proust, he said something very enlightening to me about what you're saying when he was talking about how his his grandmother used to make him go outside and experience the world. But he said what his grandmother didn't understand is that when he would read by an oak tree, um, he could experience things so fully between the adventures of the book and the, the senses of, of the outside world that he described it like this. It was like a hand reposed in the currents of the stream where you could feel 
entirely the current of all of life, right? The currents of all of life. He, he had become a receptacle to the full activity of life. And I think this is exactly what it means, if I'm understanding correctly, um, to rest and, and this leisure is that actually what you, what you are becoming is you are becoming a hand stuck in the well, reposed, not grasping, not picking, but absolutely becoming a receptacle within that flow yes. and absorbing and just uh, and just just being in the full current of life. And, and I found that so illuminating when I read this because I was like, my goodness, literature is really better than self-help books sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, and, that, and it's not by chance that as we go into self-help, we've not been very, we haven't helped ourselves very much, right? You know, like literature are maps of ways of life that are also taking into account all these paradoxical and contradictory realities. I mean, the other problem is this whole day, we've also been des describing something I think is important is irony, is that, it, you know, we, we, we have a conception of where we're going to feel best, which is sitting on the couch eating barbecue chips, which is precisely when we're not happy. We think about the world to understand it, which is the very act that makes us not fully understand it. One of the big things is since we are in A slash B, we are prone to a lot of irony. Now, we don't even know what irony means because we don't read literature, and irony is a very important category in literature, but what irony means is not this sort of like cool shrug it off, you know, irony, self-defense, I'm not going to take anything seriously. Irony means I do X for the sake of Y and X is why I don't get Y. I do X for the sake of Y and X is why I don't get Y. Okay. That's the irony. You think that you're going to understand the world by thinking about it. So you think about the world and that's precisely why you don't fully get it. It's ironic. You do X for the sake of Y and X is why you don't get Y. There's an irony, right? So much of great literature has that irony. That's part of it, which is all, tragic. Yeah, all good marketing creates it. Therefore, this is why you should buy this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, because then you're going to get Y. When actually very often he's like, I buy these things to be happy and then I have a lot of money. And it's precisely because I have a lot of money that then I'm unhappy because nobody likes me anymore. I don't know what to do with it, et cetera, so forth, right? You know, it's the same sort of game. That's irony. And, and actually, since we are ontologically A slash B, we are prone to irony. And also because there's a division between thinking and, and perceiving, which then, of course, what is ironic is that we create a definition of irony as this sort of distancing from the world precisely to avoid that irony. And then we critique that as we proceed to still participate in this literary irony uh, that we don't even realize we're doing. And so, again, one of the reasons why literature is precise, there is not um, philosophies. One of the things that have hurt so much philosophy and self-help and all of that is precisely that it has ceased being literary. A lot of the classical philosophers cared a whole lot about literature. David Hume went so far as to say is that the is that the fate of literature is the fate of the society because literature gives you those very important categories that you really like mental models and different things that you don't get in a self-help book. You know, self-help books aren't going to say, "Hey, man, engage in philosophical thinking so you don't in, in, entail an irony," right? You know, so so you know, and there's that irony of the difference between nothing and, and absolute nothingness, right? You're like you accept nihilism because you're accepting the truth. You think you're accepting the truth of the world. And in that nihilism, you miss the truth of absolute nothingness to use that language. Yeah. So irony is a really important component of existence that you have to be aware of that if you're not aware of it, you're probably in all probability going to fall into it. Hence, another reason why it is so important to do philosophical, yeah. um, you almost could call it philosophical self-expansion mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, uh, self-help books in an airport somewhere. Yeah, exactly. You never want to be that se that self that that book could help. <laughs> right? Oh, well, and again, it brings us back, you know, Walker <laughs> Percy, what's hilarious in his book, Lost in the Cosmos, where he's spoofing self-help books, where he's talking all about that. He's like, you know, why is it exactly when we're at the pinnacle of economic success, pinnacle of technology that like self-help books have like going through the roof? And why is it that so many selves are not helped, even though there's so many self-help books? Well, because something is missing. And what's missing is that it's all A equals A, or it's, you know, A doesn't equal A, or it's A equals B, when we, but what we need is an A slash B. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's what we need. That, that a, a, is, a thing is also kind of reflected in the monological structure of a yeah. self-help book, I think. Because yes, oh, just, the self, the self is there, are, it is yeah, an A. <laughs> some, of, some are praised to you, like what you should do. Well, let's say in, in platonic dialogues, for example, right? It's a dialogical structure of the text. And when you read a book like the Brothers Karamazov, for example, then you have a polylogical structure of the text, which brings even in more perspective for someone who's very poly, poly, 
totally logical is Nietzsche, for example, right? It's, it's so that there are multiple voices talking to each other. Same as the Bible. Yes. Also many voices talking with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Bible's um, a library. I mean, it's a library more than an anthology. Yeah, it's got all those different voices. Yeah. And also Dostoevsky is so great because he's the smartest characters are the ones he disagrees with most, right? He steel mans everyone that is most not like him. And that's just not something you're going to find in Sally Rooney. Oh, shoot, you probably love Sally Rooney. I'm sorry. You know, the Russians or the, you know, that's sort of like bringing the voices together because the truth is found in that um, that uh, antiphony, that sympathy. You, do, you don't find that because, and it's almost bad now because people feel like they have to do ASA because it's the truth and it's how we're going to make the world a better place which ironically is precisely what contributes to the tribalism and collide. Because what is tribalism ulti ultimately, but a desire to get to your A is A with people who share that A is A. And heck with everyone else's A is A, they're, they're wrong, man. You know, and so what is that, but an inherent, and it's like what we talk about with Cadell F, it's an inherent desire to return to a unity that never existed in the first place. And what Cadell says is if it never existed in the first place and you get it, then you die. Because what never existed is a goal that achieving means you die. And so by not so that just is to say that there are very real stakes for not accepting A slash B, because if you will not accept it, you're going to be seeking a thing that is not in life. And that means you're going to seek to leave life. And that means you'll be dead. Uh, so it's very important. This is where philosophy really does have stakes. Ontology, all this stuff that seems abstract, it doesn't matter. No, no, it has very real stakes because it determines the groundwork of your direction. And if you have the round, wrong groundwork, you're going to go in the wrong direction. And the worst yet, you probably won't even realize you're going in the wrong direction because the man in despair is the one who does not know they're in despair, as Kierkegaard says. The Calvinistic totally depraved. That's the stakes, where if you don't think, then you don't even have the framework to realize you don't think. Where if you're going in the long, wrong direction, you don't even have the map to know you're going the wrong direction. And so that that's anxious, right? That's the anxiety where you're like, oh my gosh, I could be screwing up and not even know I'm screwing up. Well, here's the question then. Are you going to take that anxiety and construct it toward a beneficial tension? Or are you going to take that anxiety and end up as the centipede who's paralyzed and doesn't move in Nietzsche and then dies? Choice is yours. You have to choose now. So on this day, choose life. That's right. There's a character, a character guard, man. Yeah, man, dude, he's a he's like man. a he's like a post he's like a post Freudian thinker. Um, there's <laughs> right? like a lot of people that like Hegel needed to be born after Freud, then it would have been very interesting. Kierkegaard needed to have met Nietzsche, everything but different. Like there's these like thinkers that didn't meet. You know, over here the Scottish Enlightenment, you know, friggin' Adam Smith, Reed, Hutchinson, yeah. Hume, they just drinking beers and having talks. But like these yeah. people really needed to meet. It would have been good. Um, sure. Gentlemen, what, supposedly what, what? my child is having some sort of part. You're trying to say something, guy? Oh yeah, I was just gonna ask you before you left. Who, who are you? How are you connected to this? Well, actually, I don't know who I am because I'm an AB and whatever I established would be an right. AA and then I would die. So, you know, death is not a thing in life and right. I'm not a thing in life either. Um, who am I? Wow. I guess, guy, well, let me check my notes. I hope I wrote that down. Um, oh, God, this is blank. It's blank. It's blank. So that's your answer. No, I live on a farm in Central Virginia. Um, I have a beautiful wife and three children. I run a wedding venue and I have lovely conversations with people like you and I. We, my wife and I scribble out crazy things. Um, so, you know, I guess that's who I am. But that was, but that's not who I am. That's just what I do. And that's just characteristics. So there always has to be a point, but that's the point of which the circle can expand. Exactly. Right. So uh, now, of course, you can open this window and actually see that I'm at, you know, at the Pentagon, but I'm not going to open the window so you can see at the Pentagon. The alias worked well enough, uh, my good man. But supposedly I'm supposed to go because what is it? There's this thing called time, but it's mechanical time. And who was that? Pontius or whatever who said the clock was oppressive because once you make it, it dissects up life and all that. Yeah. So I'm currently being oppressed. <laughs> you know, I have 13 minutes. This is the totalitarianism of mechanical time as opposed to Kairos time. But I, I, I will have to run, gentlemen. You guys are delightful. I hope we can do this. You want to go to Waffle House? I can go to Waffle House. I'll tune in. You go to IHOP. I think I'll work. Rivera will get his banana smoothie. It will go good. But this has been delightful, gentlemen. I hope we can do this again. And I'm sorry that, uh, you know, I'm sorry that mechanical time is so oppressive. <laughs> That's freaking terrible, right? You're delightful guy. It's good to meet you, guy. I've I've enjoyed your videos and interview very, very much. Thank you for your time. The school, you know, behind you, that's beautiful. School of Athens is quite nice. Uh, Daniel, this has been a delight. Thank you all for your time. Please feel free to keep talking. And I'll um I also made a note. Look at this, guys. I got another stack of notes I'm gonna put in my desk and never look at. But by having these, I'm gonna tell myself I'm gonna turn it into something. And that means there's a goal. So my yeah. leisure is always have a towardness, yeah. a directionality. Right. So then when I feel like eating those barbecue chips on the couch, I'm going to be like, I got those sticky notes. I got to do something. <laughs> and I'm going to want to expand my circle. So thank you for these sticky notes. 
uh, that's going to help me escape the temptation of barbecue chips. I really appreciate that, my friends, uh, very, very much. And I hope you have a lovely day. It's been a complete delight. You are wonderful. Thank you so much, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wait, I will end the recording. Wait. Yes.